Hi, and welcome back to Principles of Risk Management Insurance. Today, we're going to be talking about Chapter 22, Auto Insurance. So in this chapter, we're going to look at how the uh, various topics. We're going to start off with how victims are compensated for accidents. So when accidents occur, people may have uh, property damage to their car. They may have um, medical expenses. They may have pain and suffering. These are all things that can be compensated for. Unfortunately, many accidents and many victims of accidents may not recover any damages or recover money equivalent to what they should be receiving for their damages and pain and suffering. Now, that's because many drivers may be uninsured or underinsured, meaning that your claims, if they're not insured, well, there's no insurance to pay you anything. And if they're underinsured, you may reach the maximums of their insurance. Now, each state takes a different approach on how much they're going to have set as a minimum for different types of compensation for auto accidents. Now, there's a number of different approaches as well of how to protect victims from irresponsible or reckless drivers. And we're going to go over those in the future slides here. Now, the financial responsibility law requires motorists to furnish proof of financial responsibility up to a certain minimum dollar amounts. Now, and we're going to go over those minimum amounts in a minute. The, the evidence of financial responsibility can be provided in a couple of different ways. One, um, producing evidence that you have an insurance policy with certain uh, set minimums. Uh, posting a bond or depositing the amount of money required by law and also showing a person is a qualified self-insurer. So these being a self-insurer is much rarer um, of a circumstance. Most people will be insured through a company. Now, uh, also posting a bond and depositing a, sp a specific amount of money for insurance would also be something fewer people would, would be doing, or in some states, either neither of these things are allowed. But the bulk of most people will have an insurance policy and some insurance policies are required by law and at least minimums are also required by law. Now, the financial responsibility law is going to provide limited protection against these motorists who are driving around underinsured or uninsured. So there's no guarantee that uh, uh, auto accident victims, whether you're in another car or you're a pedestrian, are going to be paid. So state laws generally can require a minimum, and many of these law these minimums are relatively low. So here, the next uh, couple of slides, we're going to be looking at the uh, minimum. So this is broken up in um, bodily injury, or known as B, uh, BI liability, property damage, known as uh, PD liability, and um, now there's also um, no fault personal injury protection or PIP, as well as uninsured motor, the acronym UM, and underinsured motor, UIM. So just remember these acronyms for later that might be used, where I might be just say the acronym rather than the full words, or they might see them in a the textbook. Now, so, so if we look at the slide here, these acronyms will also be what's required by state. So, you see here a state like in Connecticut, they're going to have requirements for uh, bodily injury, property damage, and liability. Uh, now, and here are the minimum set for those levels. Some companies may have, some states like DC will have, will be a state where there's uh, uninsured motorist coverage as well. Some states like Delaware will have the PIP, the no-fault personal injury protection. So this will be your sort of code for each state that you look at. Now, most people in this class will most likely be from New York. So New York, um, we have um, pretty much everything as a required. Uninsured motor, underinsured motorists, um, per no-fault personal injury protection, bodily injury, property damage, so you'll see in New York that we have a pretty comprehensive requirements for insurance. And that's the same as New Jersey, North Dakota, uh, Minnesota. Now, some states like New Hampshire have FR only. So New Hampshire 
is just a financial responsibility law where it's going to detail what you need to do to be financially responsible, but it's not going to have many of these other requirements. Um, and then here are the minimum. So you can see that New York State, 255010. Um, and you can see that in other states you might have, let's see, 1535, which would be New Jersey is much lower than New York. Uh, so this is just important to know that each state is different in their, their minimum liabilities. Now you can always purchase above this. So you don't have to go with the minimum. You can always purchase above the minimum, but you have to recognize that each state is going to have a different value. So if you have insurance from New York state, say no, say you have your insurance from relatively low insurance values, say, maybe in Louisiana, and then you wind up having accident in New York, your minimums will be raised to the New York minimums uh, if you're driving out of the state with your insurance policy. Okay, so you can look over these more closely if there's states you want to look at. Uh, and this is why the in car insurance prices can be drastically different between different states. Uh, it could be just because the your minimum insurances are much lower. It could be the population density. It could be the uh, frequency of car theft and accidents, a lot of factors go into what's going to determine your overall rate of auto insurance. Now, if you're wondering what these little abbreviations here, <clears throat> three, three, six, five. So you see these little uh, footnotes here on these uh, minimum limit liabilities. This slide here kind of discusses them. So for footnote one, um, this is going to be, uh, and this is pretty much for, if you look back, all of these are going to be uh, footnote one. And you see that denoted up here. So footnote one is pretty much all of them. So what it describes is that uh, the first two numbers are going to be bodily uh, injury and total liability lim limits. And the third one's going to be property damage. So what it means is that if there's an accident, each individual person has $20,000 of um you know, bodily injury, but a total of $40,000 of liability limits for the car. Uh, so that's what that first footnote means. So that's pretty much all states are going to have that first two numbers are going to be individual and then the maximum uh, limits of liability. And the third will be property damage. Now footnote number two is states that have a low cost po policy like California. So if we go back up here, we see California has a footnote two right here. And what that is basically saying is that they have a special type of policy that's a low cost policy that has lower limits than what state it normally has. So California normally has 1535 and for the low cost, it's 1023. So this is extra low cost insurance. And these are to help motorists in the assigned risk category that are that to lower the overall cost of the car insurance for them. Footnote three, uh, instead of policy limits, policyholders can satisfy the requirements with the combined single limits policy amounts and that varies by state. For footnote four, uh, in, it's an additional policyholders must carry coverage for medical payments amounts vary by state. For footnote five, um, so, um, Optional limits of 10, 10, 5 for uninsured and underinsured motorists, not available under the basic policy. Um, must, most uh, uninsured motorist coverage is required by law under the standard policy, so that would be five. Now, six is New York. So in addition, policyholders must have a 50, 100 for wrongful death coverage. So there's additional wrongful death coverage in New York. And you see that in the footnote for New York, you see that little six, and that's what that refers to. Um, underinsured motorists mandates and policies and uninsured uh, limits exceed uh, 3060 with a footnote of seven, a footnote of eight, uh, compulsory to buy insurance or buy an uninsured motorist or pay an uninsured motorist vehicle fee uh, to the state for motor vehicles. Um, so these are just different roles. Each state, that's what's difficult about covering auto insurance. Each state is a different set of laws that you need to understand. So let's talk about the compulsory insurance law. So liability insurance is compulsory in most states, uh, meaning that 
you're required as a motorist to have the minimum amount of liability insurance before you start driving your vehicle, before the vehicle is registered. So this is overall a good thing because if everybody has to have insurance, it helps lower the risks for the insurance companies and lowers the rates overall and also helps protect people who, who are damaged, who get receive damage from the recklessness of other motorists. So to make sure that you have a source of funds that you can go to, that you can recover from any losses. So now this wasn't always the case. There were, there were, um, in the past, there were plenty of states that did not require uh, car insurance. And so what the end result was generally the rich people had car insurance and the poor people didn't. And it caused all sorts of problems, especially if two uninsured motorists got into an accident, there was no money for anybody to be covered for damages. Now, you know, some people believe that com the compulsory insurance laws provide, you know, greater protection and greater, you know, um, greater financial uh, responsibility for drivers. And they think it's actually better than financial responsibility laws um, because motorists must provide evidence of, you know, having um, the financial ability to uh, compensate other drivers in case of an accident. You know, so it's a pretty interesting uh, concept. However, because of the high cost of car insurance, we still, all states still struggle with a number of uninsured motorists. Now, if you are, um, if you're thinking about this compulsory war, compulsory insurance law, there are some issues with it. So in general, uh, there is no correlation between compulsory insurance laws and the number of uninsured vehicles on the highway. So it doesn't mean that because you make it that you have to have insurance, that there's that everybody's going to get the insurance. There's always going to be a certain amount of people who are going to be driving that don't have insurance, whether they can't afford it or whether they're just borrowing someone's car and they don't typically drive. Um, this is a problem. Now, if we look at the you know Consumer Federation of America, they examine the relationship between income and the uninsured. So although lower income drivers support um, a liability insurance requirement, many simply can't afford the coverage. So even though you, you may agree with car insurance, you'd like to have car insurance, you simply can't have car insurance because you can't afford it. So this group suggests some reforms would be, make it would help make liability insurance more affordable, especially for lower income drivers that have good records. So the idea is if you're a low income driver and you have a really good record of responsibility and success in driving, then you should be offered um, a plan like California does to give you a lower cost insurance. So at least you have something. Now, the in some states like New York, you know, insurance can get up to $2,000 a year or higher. So you can see how it could be, you know, difficult for some groups of people to have insurance. Now, and there are some, you know, some households are maybe 10 people in the household sharing one or two cars where only one or two drivers are insured. But everybody is, you know, um, various people could be driving the car around. So these are situations where this can develop. And sometimes it could be just ignorance. It may be somebody who isn't familiar with what the insurance laws are and don't know that they need to be, you know, have insurance before driving a car. You know, some states have employed um, computer databases in an attempt to track the uninsured motorists. And evidence suggests that, you know, such reporting systems have not effectively met um, their objectives in identifying and tracking the uninsured motorists, you know. Um, so, but it is not good to drive without insurance because if you lose the insurance in your car, your license will be suspended as well as additional fines levied against you from motor vehicles. So it's not something that, you know, you're going to want to do because eventually you'll wound up in suspension of your li license. Um, okay. Let's move over to unsatisfied uh, judgment funds. So there are a few states that establish these unsatisfied judgment funds for compensating innocent uh, accident victims. So this judgment fund, you know, uh, is a fund for compensating, you know, people in auto accidents who have exhausted all the all means of recovery. So these funds have certain common characteristics. Uh, the accident vi victim must obtain 
a judgment against the negligent motorists and show that the uh, judgment cannot be collected. You know, so they may, you know, have a lawsuit and they may win, but they still, the person just doesn't pay. You know, um, also the maximum amount paid by the fund generally is the limits specified in the state's compulsory insurance law, that 20, 40, 10 that we were talking about earlier. So the amount paid may also be reduced by, you know, collateral sources of recovery, such as workman's comp benefits and such things that we talked about last chapter. So, and also the negligent driver is not relieved of legal responsibility when the fund makes payments to the action victim. So the negligent driver must repay the fund and the fund will be going after them, maybe garnishing their wages or other judgments on their credit to try to collect this money. They, they might also lose their driver's license until they actually pay back the funds used. But this is all, different states all have different ways of doing this. So you have to look up the laws in your local state. Uh, let's talk about uninsured motorists. So it's a fact that when you're driving every day, you're probably passing multiple uninsured motorists on wherever you're going every day. So the, the, another approach for compensating injuries that you might sustain from one of these motorists um, is the injured person's uh, insurer agreed to pay, uh, to pay the accident victim who has bodily injury or property damage in some states. So, you know, caused by an uninsured motorist by a hit and run. So if you get a hit and run, that would be considered an uninsured motorist, even though you can't find the motorist. Um, you know, so that person would be a negligent dr driver. So who's, uh, you know, and this person may not be found, so there should be some sort of compensation and the un uninsured motorist coverage was, you know, we discussed this last chapter, and this is what's set up to help um, cover a damage and bodily liability to victims who are hit by an uninsured motorist. And and many times, you know, your car your car can be in an accident, and you might not be there. You might be in a parking lot. You might be uh, your car might be parked on the street, and your car gets hit by somebody, maybe maybe minor damage, and they drive away. So there is the case where that, that person may have insurance, but since you don't know who it was, they fall into an uninsured motorist uh, category. So now, if there is this uninsured coverage, uninsured motorist coverage, most will have some, you as an auto owner will have some protection against this, these uninsured driving events. Um, and you know, many states do require this coverage to be mandatory to, to include all auto liability insurance policies sold within the state. So, so if you're in New York state, um, New York state has this and New York state has a pretty comprehensive set of requirements for their car insurance. It's one of the reasons New York state car insurance is more expensive than most states is because by law, the minimums must cover a number of categories that other, other states may not make a requirement, which in the long run, I guess it's good because you're going to be covered in more situations and have more protection, um, especially in an uninsured motorist situation. Now, you know, of course, different states have different laws. Um, usually the limits for uninsured motorist coverage are, are pretty low. Um, the, and the injured person must establish that the uninsured motorist is legally liable for the accident. So meaning that if you hit a car if you rear in the car and it's 100% your fault and the car you hit does not have insurance, um, then you're going to have to pay for all the damages. Even though they're uninsured motorists, you caused the accident, you're going to have to, you and your insurance will pay for all the damages. So that's why you have to establish that there's you, there's, they have the lead, that the other person was responsible. And in some states, property damage might not be covered. So it may just be medical and uh, pain and suffering and not actually uninsured motors won't cover the repairs to the car. Okay. Let's talk about low cost auto insurance. Uh, is there such a thing? I don't, I have never experienced it, but you know, one of the reasons a lot of people are driving around without insurance is because like I said before, it's too expensive. So if you're in a state with a, it, it you must have insurance. That's what the compulsory insurance means. Then, Generally, um, 
this, even though you make it a law that everybody who drives a car must have insurance, it doesn't mean everybody's going to get insurance. And the main reason that they don't get insurance is because they can't afford it. So some states have decided to make a, a low cost auto insurance to provide minimum amounts of coverage, usually liability lower than the state minimums uh, at reduced rates to motorists who can't afford the regular car insurance due to financial uh, limitations uh, as far as the amount of income they make. Um, and they just can't afford, they meet the requirements where they can't afford regular insurance. So for example, a state like New Jersey has a standard policy and then has a basic low cost policy are available. So the uh, standard policy is going to be similar to the auto insurance in other states, but the basic policy is going to have lower limits. So with, with, um, this would be for someone who doesn't have a lot of assets. Uh, and doesn't have a lot of financial ability, so it would still allow them to drive, but with a minimum, a very minimum set of insurance. Now, this isn't good, you know, this is better than having no insurance, but certainly would cover, probably the insurance would be good to cover most routine accidents, but would not be good enough to cover very significantly um, high cost accidents, especially where fatalities may be involved. Now, California is another state that has a low cost plan, um, that's available to drivers over the age of 19 who have good driving records. Uh, so rates are determined by, uh, of course, the county. Uh, the drivers may purchase uh, up to 10,000 personal liability coverage and 20,000 per accident. So it's lower than the actual uh, minimums, but it's there again to try to make sure everybody can ob obtain the car insurance. Now there is this no pay, no play laws. So this is another approach where no pay, no play, um, which restricts uh, uninsured motors from suing negligent drivers for economic damages, such as compensation for pain and suffering. So in some states, you know, uh, consider in some states are considering your proposal as a method of reducing um, the number of uninsured drivers. So. Uh, as an example, so an uninsured driver uh, who is, say, a majority of fault of the accident can't collect damages uh, for the accident. So it's basically saying if you're uninsured and, and you're involved in an accident and it was mostly your fault, you're not going to uh, receive any money from the other person's insurance policy. Um, and that's limited to non-economic damages. Um, so, so they can receive some money, but just not like for pain and suffering. Okay, so let's move on to no fault insurance. So no fault auto insurance is another uh, type of compensating uh, um, injured accident victims. So it's another method for if you're injured, how to be compensated. Um, now, let's first define the uh, no fault insurance and, cur and currently 22 states including district of columbia and puerto rico have some type of no fault law uh involving you know bodily injury and so basically what this means is say um and new york has this as well say there is an accident and two cars collide and there's met both parties in both car have um medical issues and you're going to require payments for bodily injury. You know, they broke a knee, they broke an ankle, they have to go to the emergency room for cuts and, and concussion, things like this. So what happens in this case is each person's insurance company covers the person regardless of who's at fault. So there's no fault claim for bodily injury. So if somebody rear-ends your car and you're injured, your insurance companies will pay for your medical and bodily injury uh, payments regardless of it, if that it, that's your fault or not your fault. Uh, now, as far as collision damages on personal property, that's something different. But no fault generally uh, is going to result from bodily injury. Um, and there could be, of course, monetary thresholds of how much, um, you know, your insurance companies would have to bear before they can actually uh, collect from the other insurance company. So, you know, obviously if, 
Uh, if the limit is say 10,000 and you, you sustain $50,000 worth of bodily injury, then the insurance company would have a right to go after the other insurance company for the excessive amount of uh, bodily injury. So it gets a little complicated, but let's talk about some more uh, basic characteristics of the no, no fault uh, plan. So there are different types of no fault plans depending on the state uh, you're living in. So there's a pure no fault, modified no fault, add on plan and choice no fault plan. Now, so let's talk about each of these. Under a pure no fault plan, accident victims cannot sue at all, regardless of the amount of the claim and no payments would be made for pain and suffering. So in effect, the liability system would be abolished uh, because accident victims uh, could not sue for damages for bodily injury. So instead, injured persons would receive unlimited medical benefits and wages from their insurance company. And currently no state has this pure no fault because uh, it's, it's most, most people consider that to be totally unfair. So if under the modified uh, no fault plan, a injured person has the right to sue uh, a negligent driver only if the bodily injury claim exceeds the dollar um, threshold. So if the accident victim, they're only going to collect from their own insurance uh, up to a certain level. So the, in this modified plan, it's going to it's going to restrict um, how much you can collect from your own insurance. And then the remainder would be from the other person's insurance if they're at fault. So that would be called a modify. Now, an add on plan pays benefits to an accident victim with without regard to fault. So this is going to be the, the injured person still has the right to sue for negligent drivers who caused the accident. Um, so this plan is also going to include the right to sue for pain and suffering because of the injured person retains the right to sue. The add on plans are not true no fault plans. Uh, and that's why they modified them as an add on. But they also have this choice no fault plan. So um, I guess the closest state to us that has this is New Jersey. And under this law, motorists can elect to be covered or not covered under the state's no fault law and pay lower premiums. So if you, you can elect not to have this coverage and pay a lower premium, which I think is not wise to do that, you know, or they can retain the right to sue under the, under the liability system and pay higher premiums. So it really gives you a little bit more choice of how you want to, um, look at these no fault laws and how you want to apply them to your policies. Um, all right, let's keep going here. Okay, so let's look at some no-fault benefits. Now, no-fault benefits are provided by adding an, uh, an endorsement to an auto insurance policy. So the endorsement is typically called the Personal Injury Protection Coverage, or PIP, which we talked about earlier, which is going to describe the no-fault benefits. So benefits are restricted to an injured person's economic loss, such as medical expenses, a percentage of lost wages, and certain other expenses depending on the policy. So the injured person can sue for non-economic loss, such as pain and suffering and inconvenience, only if the dollar thre threshold exceeds the threshold of that's, that an insurance policy, if that's met or, met or exceeded. So the following benefits are typically provided um, under these uh, no-fault benefits, which are going to be uh, metal expenses, which are, which are paid usually up to some maximum amount uh, before it's transferred to the other policy. Uh, payments are made for the loss of earnings. So if you can't go to work for a certain period of time, then you're going to should be covered for the wages you lose because you can't make it to work. Um, there's also essential services expenses. Um, so ordinarily performed by individual persons, including, you know, if you are, when they say essential services expenses, Basically, you're a house person who you don't have a job, but your family relies on you to cook meals and clean up and things like that. So if you're not able to do that and a family has to hire a maid or a cook, then that would be an example of some of those service expenses. Funeral expenses, that is if you die, they'll pay for the funeral. And survivors lost benefits. So if you die, then your surviving family members would get 
some benefits as well. Okay, now there's also the optional no fault benefits um, that are above the prescribed minimums. So the, so one could be the right to sue. So, so in states with the add-on plans we talked about earlier, there are no restrictions on the right to sue. So they don't give up their right to sue and they're able to sue the other um, parties involved in the accident uh, to, you know, to help recover from loss. So definitely if the, the driver is very negligent and they can sue above and beyond what's inside the policy. Now, um, as far as, you know, bodily injury, uh, that's going to be some of these no fault laws will only cover bodily injury. Uh, some exceptions are in Michigan and motorists are allowed to sue for negligent drivers for property damage. So you have to see if the state, is it going to be um, bodily injury and property damage or vice versa. So that's why it's really critical to read your insurance policy to get an idea of what it's covering and what you can add to it to make your benefits uh, and your insurance a little bit stronger. So there are definitely some arguments for the no fault uh, laws. So one argument is, is difficulty in determining fault. So a lot of the critics to this are going to say, well, how exactly are you determining fault? And a lot of states will determine a percentage of fault based on how the accident occurs. And there's some accidents where fault is pretty clear. For example, you're stopped at a stoplight and someone hits you from behind as a rear end. It's pretty clear who, whose fault that is. In other accidents, the, the determining exactly whose fault at fault or the percentage of fault is more difficult. Um, inequality in claim payments. So they would say that under the, you know, this no fault systems that, you know, small claims can be often overpaid where serious claims can be underpaid because the, uh, the way that it's set up, the recovery of losses may not be accurate. And usually if you were able to sue or go for litigation, a more detailed and closer look would be put in place to determine what payments or claims should be awarded. A high transaction costs and attorney fees. So critics also argue that the, the present legal system incurs very high transactional costs and attorney fees. So more than half of, of all these legal fees are moving through uh, these courts, never reach the injured, intended injured victim. So it's because the lawyers take a, a bulk of the, um, the money that is awarded. Uh, fraudulent and inflated claims is another problem where claims are, you know, intentionally uh, developed or inflated for people to try to re recover um, more money than they needed, such as, you know, filing fake claims. Uh, there can be collusion among doctors and attorneys where they, in some really bad cases, they might say, okay, we're going to, uh, I'm going to charge you $5,000 for all these medical expenses, but I'm going to give you $3,000 back on that. You know, really shady stuff can go on in fraud, which really is what um, escalates the cost of insurance for everybody is the amount of fraud in the system that has to be covered by honest motorists uh, who pay their, their premium. So if there's a $5 million uh, lawsuit awarded based on fraudulent claims and that's paid, well, that's going to raise the insurance for everybody else. So with that lawsuit, maybe it should really have been $100,000 was the payout. Now the insurance company has to pay, you know, five million if their if their coverage was up that high, which rarely would be up that high. But um, that would certainly have to be absorbed by all the other drivers. And then there's also the delay in payments uh, under the system. There could be, you know, take a long time to receive um, payments, and these are all uh, arguments that for supporting no fault laws. So if you support the no fault, it simplifies these transactions. So if it's already written out that if this, if an action occurs and you're majority at fault, um, we're just going to say no fault and we're going to, we're going to quickly resolve the payments, and the compensation for medical, um, bodily injury and things of that nature. And of course, um, this is going to speed up the um the transaction and reduce the amount of uh court time and things like that
So let's look at some arguments against no fault. So these would be some arguments why no fault is not good. Now, <clears throat> um, one could be defects in the negligence uh, system are exaggerated. So basically a large portion of fatal crashes and serious accidents involve alcohol where fault can usually be determined without difficulty. So also the fact that most claims are settled out of court suggests that, you know, the present system works fairly well and that the no fault would not be good because the current legal system works, works better than uh, in compensating accident victims than a no fault system. Two, claims of uh, efficiency and premium savings are exaggerated. You know, so one of the big things for having no fault is that it's going to, it's overall going to help lower the premiums by lowering the costs of litigation. Uh, and that this, you know, has been greatly exaggerated in that premiums actually uh, have not uh, gone down. In fact, they've increased more rapidly for these no fault policies. Um, court delays are not universal. That just means in some states, courts are really not as backed up and can process these lawsuits pretty quickly. Safe drivers may be penalized. So if you know a no-fault plan is gonna penalize safe drivers and provide a bonus for irresponsible drivers who cause accidents. So the idea is that you know, no-fault really benefits the irresponsible driver who causes the most accidents, and the safe driver is going to have to uh, pay in their premiums an amount of money uh, that's going to basically compensate for the, for the bad drivers uh, in the pool. Uh, there's no payment for pain and suffering. So yes, as we talked about, many of these plans don't include pain for pain and suffering and they're no fault. And that's just going to wind up um, going to the courts anyway. So it takes away the benefit of the no fault plan. And also the liability system needs to be reformed. Um, so if the liability system was reformed, it would make uh, these no fault plans uh, unnecessary because the legal system more quickly be able to determine and award um, damages in auto accidents. Okay, so let's look at uh, approaches for compensating auto victims. Um, so some states are going to, this is the last slide of this compensation for auto victims of 14. So some states are, have repealed their no-fault laws because of re relatively low monetary thresholds have increased the number of lawsuits. So even though they had these no-fault laws, because the amount of money that could be compensated was so low, people wound up accepting, not wound up suing above and beyond what the no fault limits were. So it made the no fault laws really um, useless. So they were repealed because they just didn't attend the service. Uh, now they didn't want to raise the, the minimums of the no fault law because that would greatly raise premiums. So they just did away with it altogether. And, you know, there's been a study by the civil justice that found that no-fault plans, A, um, in initially uh, reduced attorney fees and claim processing costs, and B, premiums are higher in no-fault states. So, um, so it's really, you know, each state has to, has to review the results of their no-fault plans to see if it's worthwhile to move forward with them. Okay, so let's talk now about auto insurance for high-risk drivers. Now, if you're a high-risk driver, which means that you must have had an accident or um, some sort of, um, you, you know, something on your record that makes it difficult for you to obtain auto insurance. Maybe you have a DWI, maybe you've been uh, at fault of too many accidents, maybe you're just in a risk group, such as uh, a young male adult. So or a teenage driver. Uh, so that makes it difficult to obtain auto insurance through the normal markets. So of course, we all know about younger drivers cause more accidents. Um, and drivers, you know, with poor driving records tend to have more accidents. Um, and of certainly people who've been uh, driving while well under the influence of drugs and alcohol tend to have more accidents. So these drivers, you know, they in states where you are mandated to have car insurance, um, they, how do you deal with these high risk automotives, uh, where most insurance companies don't want to insure them? Well, they, they create a, um, what they call a high risk plan. 
So this high risk plan is going to be available to motorists who are unable to obtain uh, auto insurance. When they say in a voluntary market, that means that insurance companies will work with them. So, so because there's some certain amount of drivers, insurance companies just refuse to um, voluntarily sign up, they get put into this assigned risk plan. Um, so uh, drivers who have this high risk, they can purchase the insurance from, um, you know, a number of different um, high risk plans that basically the insurance companies are going to have to take a share of drivers in this high risk category. And that's one way of trying to obtain a higher percentage of insured motorists. So, so this proportional share, if say there is in the state, 10% of the motors are going to be classified as high risk, then each insurance company has to uh, have 10% of their overall portfolio be high risk drivers. Um, and the premiums are going to be substantially higher than those that are charged in the voluntary market. So, for example, if you're in the high risk category, you're going to be paying the most for your insurance. And some of you may have already experienced that. So that's why it's really critical that if you're a relatively young driver to be as careful as possible, because, you know, if you get in that high risk pool, it may take years to get out of that pool. So here's just a, just a slide describing, you know, for the pool of drivers, this cloud represents the pool of drivers who um, can't, can't purchase car insurance because they're in a high risk group. And so if, you know, if ABC Group writes 8% of the auto insurance premiums in the state, they have to pick up 8% of the drivers. So it's another way of looking at it. The size of your, your insurance portfolio is going to dedicate the size of the percentage of the high-risk drivers that you're going to have to um, extend policies to if you're an insurance company. So if the, you know, in the, this way, they'll be able to make sure everybody who needs high-risk insurance they will be there will be a marketplace for them to buy it okay so a few states have established this joint underwriting association so this is just a um an association um basically really an organization of auto insurers that operate in the state uh which high-risk um businesses place into a common pool and each company is going to pay um into that pool of losses and expenses. So it's basically the insurance companies are going to team up to create a joint underwriting association to cover all the high risk drivers rather than, you know, each taking their own. It's pretty much the same with each taking their own percentage, but here they're just making a distinct unit or a joint underwriting association. Um, and this association is going, to, is going to design the policy and set the rates and the underwriting losses are going to be shared uh, based um, by the companies who are going to be uh, writing these policies. So the number of insurers are designed as, a, as servicing um, these high-risk people. So all the insurers are going to participate in this pool to basically uh, split up the responsibilities in one joint uh, policy pool. Now, um, a few states have established this uh, reinsurance facility or pool. Uh, now, under this arrangement, the insurance companies must accept all applicants for insurance, both good and bad. And if the applicant is considered high risk, the insurer has the option of placing them in the reinsurance pool. Uh, so although the high risk driver in the reinsurance pool, um, the original insurer services the policy. So underwriting losses in the reinsurance facility is shared by all um, auto insurance companies in the state. So this is just a way of basically saying whoever comes to you and wants auto insurance, you have to give it to them. But you could reassign the high risk motors into this uh, reinsurance facility. So all the companies would just, so one company may get, you know, a disproportional amount of drivers who are high risk. But it's not going to matter because they're going to re put them in the in the pool in the reinsurance pool, which all the auto insurance companies are going to maintain in a fair and equitable way. So it's just a way of kind of breaking that out. So the Maryland Automobile Insurance Fund uh, is going to provide insurance to high risk drivers who have been canceled or refused insurance by 
private insurers. So this is going to be a case where there's a state entity that makes um, auto insurance available to any motorists in Maryland who aren't able to obtain the insurance in the voluntary market. So this is a third way of doing it is having the state run an insurance pool. And then um, a lot of states don't like to do this because they feel like the insurance companies take advantage and may put more people in this high risk pool uh, and really force the state to pay a lot of th this to, to have to sustain a lot of this risk of these high risk motorists, which in the long run just raises taxes on everybody. And they're especially insurers that specialize in insuring motorists with poor driving records. So this could be a company that's just going to really specialize on dealing with drivers on with poor records and and uh, who are in high risk. So these insurers typically insure drivers who have you know, been canceled or refused by other drivers. Uh, and the premium is going to be much, much higher. So in this particular instance, they are taking on the additional risk of these poor drivers, but then charging them substantially higher rates for uh, their high risk tendencies. Okay, so let's talk about the cost of auto insurance. What, um, what factors are going to be influence the rate of money that you pay? Why is it that someone in South Carolina pays $300 a month, $300 a year for car insurance, and someone in New York pays $2,000 a year for car insurance? Well, one is going to be, we'll go through this list here. One is territory. So if you're going to live, um, it's, where does your car live basically? So, um, if your automobile, um, is going to be something that's going to be, um, affected by the outside environment, each state is going to divide their state up into different territories, you know? So New York state, New York state's a great example because you have a big city, a lot of suburbs, and then a lot of uh, rural land. So you're going to have the highest rate of car insurance in New York City, and then you're going to have slightly lower rates in Nassau County, and then slightly lower rates, lower rates in Suffolk County, but you, but not that much lower. But you're going to have drastically lower rates if you go um, way upstate New York to some communities that there are uh, fewer lower poppy dense population densities, fewer cars on the road. So each territory in the state is going to help in determining how much the car insurance should, should be. So if you live in, you know, Long Island, if you live in Queens, uh, Kings, which is Brooklyn, uh, Nassau or Suffolk County, you're probably paying a very high rate of car insurance. If you were to move upstate, um, you would see your car insurance be cut in half or more, maybe e even, you know, be, 70% less than you're paying downstate because of the high frequency of theft, accidents, and damage down here. Uh, so territory where you live is a big part of your, one of the biggest parts of how much you're going to pay in car insurance. Now, there's also age, gender, and marital status. So they like to say that, you know, um, and some of this seems really unfair. So you're judged on your age. The younger you, if you're very young or very old driver, you're going to have higher car rate of insurance. They also judge it on your gender. They would say that statistically male drivers have more accidents of higher damage amounts and more frequency than female drivers. So male drivers should pay more car insurance. Also marital status. If you're married, uh, it's, you're less likely to have car accidents than if you're single. Now these are all supported by statistics. So even though it seems um, almost wrong to judge a person based on age, gender, or marital status, insurance companies have been doing it forever and they're gonna, and they're, are gonna continue to do that, uh, mostly because they have the actual statistics of the driver's uh, records uh, behind them to, to help reinforce the reason for charging higher rates. Um, you know, typically, gender is very important in determining premium. So male drivers, typically, you're involved in a lot more accidents uh, and fatalities than female drivers. And it's been that way for a long time consistently. So as a result, they have to pay higher rates than female drivers. Um, so it's just a fact of life that car insurance is going to judge you. You know, and certainly some people might feel that, you know, if you're over, you know, 65 years of age, uh, where you, you start to have more accidents due to reduced reflexes, reduced sight and hearing, um, 
that you should pay more in insurance as well. And that's what the auto insurance companies uh, decided. Also, the use of your auto, are you using your auto for uh, occasional pleasure trips or are you using it for day-to-day -day travel and commuting? So one of the reasons um, Long Island in New York City rates of car insurance are so high is that it uh, is a terrible traffic here. And the traffic and the long long commuting distances also add to uh, more frequent accidents. So it depends on how you use the auto for business, for pleasure, for commuting. It's all going to have an effect on your right on your rates. Now, um, your driver education. If you have, um, you know, there are driver education programs, defensive driver courses you can take to help lower your rates, and this will all. Uh, help to get a lower rate. So if you have no driver education, you'll have a higher rate. Some plans, you have a good student discount. So students who have a good grade point average get discounts on their auto insurance. So if you are a student who has a good grade point average, B or higher, A or higher, you might want to call your insurance company and let them know they may actually give you a discount. Um, number and types of cars that you, you're insuring. Some cars you pay more insurance on than other cars. So if you're going to have a sports car, that's very expensive, the insurance will be higher than say on a Honda Civic or a Honda Accord. Uh, and then also uh, your your driving record is gonna play a key role. Uh, the more accidents you're involved with, the higher your insurance rates will go. So that's something that um, you wanna really protect your driving record as much as possible. Um, in fact, the last two accidents I were, was involved in, I was rear-ended, and in both cases, I, I um, made sure that the other driver was stated 100% fault. So that would have a less of an effect on my insurance rates or no effect on my insurance rates. But still, some insurance companies, just the fact that you're in an accident is going to affect your, whether it's your fault or not, can affect your rates. So you just got to be careful to be as few accidents as possible. Then also when they say insurance score, I think what they mean here is your, your, your finance score. So you know your FICO score and you know um, your credit scores they can look at. So they tie a, um, they make an association that people with poor credit scores are gonna have more accidents. Uh, so if you have a higher credit score, then your insurance rates will be lower based on your higher credit score. So this is another piece of statistical information that, you know, they assume that people who are careless with their credit usage and with their um, paying their bills will also be um, take less care than others as far as taking care of your car, fixing your car, maintaining your car and your driving. And this is how car insurance companies do it. They, they look for as many supporting statistical factors they can utilize uh, to make it make the chances of you having an accident more predictable. Okay, so the 10 most expensive and least expensive states for auto insurance. So this is uh, pretty interesting here. Uh, we have, so of course the most expensive states are, are New York and New Jersey coming in at number one and number two, uh, and then also Connecticut rounding out the top 10. And the least expensive states would be and these are the states that you want to move to and get car insurance. You have North Carolina, North Dakota, South Dakota, Maine, Idaho, number one, Iowa, number two, Indiana, Vermont. So these are these are states that with which have lower populations and lower rates of accidents, and of course have lower insurance costs. So um, if you if you're deciding on moving out uh, outside of New York, New Jersey, check out some of these states here. It may save a significant amount on your auto insurance. So even though they say the average auto insurance expenditure is say $1,235 in New York State, a good number of people are paying $2,000 or more for insurance depending on who and how and what you are, as discussed earlier. Now, um, if we look at the groups, the age groups of drivers, as far as crashes by age, you can see that the total uh, percentage of the number of driver of uh, drivers so about five percent are 16 to 20 uh, but their involvement rate in accidents is 35 percent so this is number of accidents uh, actually 35 number of accidents per hundred thousand licensed drivers so you can see that the this young age group has the highest 
amount of involvement rate in accidents, where the lowest involvement rate would be um, 65 to 74 has the lowest involvement rate. All so you would think they have the lowest rates. Not always, um, not always true. So it's kind of interesting in looking at um, this is drivers and fatal crashes. Drivers uh, in all crashes, you can see that still it, they're still pretty similar, but um, some gruesome details. So let's move on to tips for buying auto insurance. So some tips here is number one. I would say carry adequate liability insurance, which means you don't have to accept the minimum the state offers. Maybe the minimum is 10, as 20, 40, 10. You can easily double that to 40, 80, 20 with um, maybe it's only an extra $5 a month. You'd be surprised how inexpensive it is to double or triple your basic liability levels. So make sure that you don't oh, you don't take the bare minimum that you always try to double or triple the amount of liability coverage you have to better protect your assets and even consider getting an umbrella plan carrying higher deductibles this will lower your insurance rates um, sometimes it's advantageous sometimes it's not advantageous so for example you could say you have collision on your car you can go with zero deductible which is the most expensive five hundred dollar deductible or thousand dollar deductible so if you go with the zero dollar deductible, they may charge you an extra three hundred dollars a year to have the zero dollar deductible for a car accident. Now, the five hundred dollar deductible, they may only charge you a uh, hundred dollars a year, and that means if you do have an accident, the first five hundred dollars you're responsible for paying, and they'll cover the rest. So if you think about it, if it saves you two hundred dollars a year, you just have to have three years where you don't have an accident, where you've pretty much self-funded your deductible. Having deductibles of $1,000 per accident uh, may not be that wise. You may only um, save, uh, maybe you'll save an extra $100 doing that on your insurance or maybe even an extra $200, but the chances are that, you know, if you do have an auto accident, you want to be stuck paying $1,000 of the damages yourself by, by choosing a too big of a deductible. Uh, and then there's also dropping collision altogether. So if you have an older vehicle, you could drop collision and that would uh, drop in collision would uh, lower your insurance altogether. So collision may be anywhere from 200 to uh, $500 a year added to your insurance policy. So if you have an old vehicle only worth $2,000 or $1,000, why bother covering collision where you, um, it isn't worth it? So, you know, if your collision is going to cost you $500 a year, after four years of driving that car around, you've paid for the whole entire car itself. So there's no point of keeping collision in older vehicles. Uh, shopping around is always advantageous. So, because um, they compete. These, these companies are, are in a competitive capitalist market, and they compete to offer you the lowest rate possible. So that's a good thing. But you also have to remember that they have a rate creep. So... Much like I, I can give you, if you're familiar with ever paying a cable bill or an internet bill, you always get these really nice introductory uh, prices to start out, $45 a month. Um, and then before you know it, it's $100 a month the next year after you come off the introductory rates. Same thing with car insurance. When you first get your car insurance, it's going to be pretty competitive. But after staying with the same company for a number of years, they can almost double your rates by slowly moving it up a couple hundred dollars a year. And then when you switch to a new company, you get a significant savings. And that's why a lot of companies, these insurance companies can confidently say, well, you know, switch to us and we'll, we'll, we'll save you $500 a year in insurance or more. Uh, they can confidently say that because they're basically lowering their rates to get you as a new customer. And once you're a new customer and you stay with them for a while, they don't, they don't really, um, value your business. They just keep jacking up your rates because they know it's a pain in the neck to switch car insurance. So they kind of take advantage of you. So that's why it's always good to shop around. You first get your policy and continue to monitor and shop around years later when if you think you feel like your policies are getting too expensive. Switching to another insurance company is probably an easy way to reduce. I just switched my insurance company uh, and I saved $800 a year by switching my insurance company. Uh, now, take advantage of discounts there are a lot of discounts uh offered for um drivers you know so you get if you if you're insuring multiple cars you get a discount 
If you have no accidents in, in, in usually three to five year periods, you get a big discount. If you're, if you're over age 50, you get a discount. If you're, if you're taking a defensive driving course, you get a discount. If your car has anti-theft devices, anti, anti-lock brakes, um, if your car has other safety devices like automatic stopping, uh, if you have a, you know, there's good student discounts, there's discounts if you link up your auto and homeowners policy. I did this. I matched my, uh, homeowners and auto policy together and I saved an extra hundred dollars off uh, each policy. Uh, and also completing your college degree because college graduates generally have lower rates than non-college graduates. So it's another way of lowering your, so get those discounts and always review your discounts with your agent or your policy to make sure you're getting all the discounts you should have. And that may not always all be there. Okay. Improve your driving record. Of course, Try as best you can never to have an accident, never to be involved in an accident. Drive very cautiously, minimize your driving because this, you know, driving record is probably one of the biggest um, contributors to high insurance rates. Maintain good credit. We were talking about this before. Keep your finance, your FICO scores, your credit scores high. Pay off all your credit cards on time. Um, Make sure you don't have, you don't overextend yourself by taking on too much credit and just, you know, being a good credit, uh, score is going to result in lower insurance, uh, premiums and something you can easily control with a little bit of financial, uh, discipline. Okay. Uh, and our last slide, we're going to talk about, uh, emerging issues in uh, auto insurance. So as times change and as things develop, uh, certain things come up that start impacting the driver insurance and insurance rates. The biggest thing I would say would be distracted drivers due to cell phones. Uh, people, and I see this constantly, people holding their cell phone, text messaging, uh, talking on their cell phone, playing a game on their cell phone when driving, watching a video on their cell phone when driving, looking for music to play while they're driving. These are all very dangerous thing to do and, and lead to a lot of accidents. And there have been cases where, you know, they have proven someone was on their cell phone crafting a text message uh, or, um, and you can of course get tickets for driving while using your cell phone. So this has been a big impact of increasing insurance rates has been these distracted drivers. Autonomous vehicles. So in the beginning, this is something that once uh, in the future, I'm predicting this here, and you'll see in your lifetime, and you'll be like, wow, Professor Nugent was really right about that. I thought he was totally wrong, but he was right when he said that all cars will be autonomous in your lifetime, meaning that there will be no more drivers. So once all cars are self-driving, accidents will plummet. Uh, fatalities will plummet. Uh, the computers are going to be better drivers than we are, you know, you know. Tens of thousands of people die every year from human caused accidents. And that rate, you know, say 50,000 people die a year in a car accident. That's just an S, it's just a number I made up. May be accurate, may not be accurate, but I am sure that that rate will drop below 1,000 people, uh, related to auto deaths once there's autonomous driving for everybody. That's how confident I am that most accidents are, are caused by human error, human failure, and that the auto, the computerized auto autonomous vehicles are just not going to have those problems. Um, and of course, accidents attributed to drugs and marijuana. Now, alcohol, of course, has always been a big problem, but as marijuana becomes legal in more and more states, this is going to be another uh, drug that will be more commonly consumed that does impair your driving and may uh, cause, create situations where more accidents will occur. Okay, so that is the chapter uh, 21, and this chapter finishes our auto insurance, and then we're going to be moving into our next chapter, which we're going to start talking uh, in chapter 22. We're going to start talking about homeowners insurance. So stick, stick around for that exciting lecture. Take care.